Ella. Mr. Anderson says I can have lunch at his house before I meet my new family. It wasn't his idea, but when Aaron, his son, that was the boy's name, suggested it, Mr. Anderson seemed okay with it. I'm grateful. I'm not ready to go live with a bunch of strangers yet. I'm scared and nervous and worried about so many things. I don't even know where to start. Mostly, I feel angry. I'm angry with my parents for dying. Angry with them for leaving me behind. I'm an orphan now. But maybe I have a new friend. Aaron said that he was eight years old, about two years older than me, so there isn't any chance we'd be in the same grade. But when I said that we'd probably be going to the same school anyway, he said no, we wouldn't. He said he didn't go to public school. He said his father was very particular about these kinds of things and that he'd been homeschooled by private tutors his whole life. We're sitting next to each other in the car ride back to his house when he says quietly, My dad never lets me invite people over to our house. He must like you. I smile, secretly relieved. I really hope that this means I'll have a new friend. I've been so scared to move here. So scared to be somewhere new and to be all alone. But now, sitting next to this strange blonde boy with the light green eyes, I'm beginning to feel like things might be okay. At least now, even if I don't like my new parents, I'll know I'm not completely alone. The thought makes me both happy and sad. I look over at Aaron and smile. He smiles back. When we get to his house, I take a moment to admire it from the outside. It's a big, beautiful old house painted the prettiest blue. It has big white shutters on the windows and a white fence around the front yard. Pink roses are growing around the edges, peeking through the wooden slats of the fence, and the whole thing looks so peaceful and lovely that I feel immediately at home. My worries vanish. I'm so grateful for Mr. Anderson's help, so grateful to have met his son. I realized then that Mr. Anderson might have brought his son to my meeting today just to introduce me to someone my own age. Maybe he was trying to make me feel at home. A beautiful blonde lady answers the front door. She smiles at me, bright and kind, and doesn't even say hello to me before she pulls me into her arms. She hugs me like she's known me forever, and there's something so comfortable about her arms around me that I embarrass everyone by bursting into tears. I can't even look at anyone after I pull away from her. She told me her name was Mrs. Anderson, but that I could call her Lila if I wanted, and I wipe at my tears, ashamed of my overreaction. Mrs. Anderson tells Aaron to take me upstairs to his room while she makes us some snacks before lunch. Still sniffling, I follow him up the stairs. His room is nice. I sit on his bed and look at his things. Mostly it's pretty clean except that there's a baseball mitt on his nightstand and there are two dirty baseballs on the floor. Aaron catches me staring and scoops them up right away. He seems embarrassed as he tucks them in his closet and I don't understand why. I was never very tidy. My room was always... I hesitate. I try to remember what my old bedroom looked like, but for some reason I can't. I frown. Try again. Nothing. And then I realize I can't remember my parents' faces. Terror barrels through me. What's wrong? Aaron's voice is so sharp, so intense that I look up, startled. He's staring at me from across the room, the fear on his face reflected in the mirrors on his closet doors. What's wrong? He says again. Are you okay? I, I don't. I falter, feeling my eyes refill with tears. I hate that I keep crying. I hate that I can't stop crying. I can't remember my parents, I say. Is that normal? Aaron walks over, sits next to me on his bed. I don't know, he says. We're both quiet for a while. Somehow it helps. Somehow just sitting next to him makes me feel less alone, less terrified. Eventually, my heart stops racing. 
after I've wiped away my tears, I say, Don't you get lonely being homeschooled all the time? He nods. Why won't your dad let you go to a normal school? I don't know. What about birthday parties, I ask. Who do you invite to your birthday parties? Aaron shrugs. He's staring into his hands when he says, I've never had a birthday party. What? Really? I turn to face him more fully. But birthday parties are so fun. I used to. I blink, cutting myself off. I can't remember what I was about to say. I frown, trying to remember something. Something about my old life, but when the memories don't materialize, I shake my head to clear it. Maybe I'll remember later. Anyway, I say, taking a quick breath. You have to have a birthday party. Everyone has birthday parties. When is your birthday? Slowly, Aaron looks up at me. His face is blank, even as he says. April 24th. April 24th. I say, smiling. That's great. We can have cake. The days pass in a stifled panic, an excruciating crescendo toward madness. The hands of the clock seem to close around my throat and still. I say nothing. Do nothing. I wait. Pretend. I've been paralyzed here for two weeks, stuck in the prison of this ruse, this compound. Evie doesn't know that her plot to bleach my mind failed. She treats me like a foreign object, distant, but not unkind. She instructed me to call her Evie, told me she was my doctor, and then proceeded to lie in great detail about how I'd been in a terrible accident, that I'm suffering from amnesia, that I need to stay in bed in order to recover. She doesn't know that my body won't stop shaking, that my skin is slick with sweat every morning, that my throat burns from the constant return of bile. She doesn't know what's happening to me. She could never understand the sickness plaguing my heart. She couldn't possibly understand this agony. Remembering. The attacks are relentless. Memories assault me while I sleep, jolting me upright, my chest seizing in panic over and over and over until finally I meet Dawn on the bathroom floor, the smell of vomit clinging to my hair, the inside of my mouth. I can only drag myself back to bed every morning and force my face to smile when Evie checks on me at sunrise. Everything feels wrong. The world feels strange. Smells confuse me. Words don't feel right in my mouth anymore. The sound of my own name feels at once familiar and foreign. My memories of people and places seem warped, fraying threads coming together to form a ragged tapestry. But Evie, my mother, I remember her. Evie? I pop my head out of the bathroom, clutching a robe to my wet body, I search my room for her face. Evie, are you there? Yes. I hear her voice just seconds before she's suddenly standing before me, holding a set of fresh sheets in her hands. She's stripping my bed again. Did you need something? We're out of towels. Oh. Easily rectified, she says and hurries out the door. Not seconds later, she's back, pressing a warm, fresh towel into my hands. She smiles faintly. Thanks, I say, forcing my own smile to stretch, to spark life in my eyes. And then I disappear into the bathroom. The room is steaming, the mirrors fogged, perspiring. I grip the towel with one hand, watching as beads of water race down my bare skin. Condensation wears me like a suit. I wipe at the damp metal cuffs locked around my wrists and ankles, their glowing blue light my constant reminder that I am in hell. I collapse with a heavy breath onto the floor. I'm too hot to put on clothes, but I'm not ready to leave the privacy of the bathroom yet, so I sit here, wearing nothing but these manacles, and drop my head into my hands. 
My hair is long again. I discovered it like this, long, heavy, dark, one morning. And when I asked her about it, I nearly ruined everything. What do you mean? Evie said, narrowing her eyes at me. Your hair has always been long. I blinked at her, remembering to play dumb. I know. She stared at me a while longer before she finally let it go. But I'm still worried I'll pay for that slip. Sometimes it's hard to remember how to act. My mind is being attacked, assaulted every day by emotion I never knew existed. My memories were supposed to be erased. Instead, they're being replenished. I'm remembering everything. My mother's laugh, her slender wrists, the smell of her shampoo, and the familiarity of her arms around me. The more I remember, the less this place feels foreign to me. The less these sounds and smells, these mountains in the distance, feel unknown. It's as if the disparate parts of my most desperate self are stitching back together, as if the gaping holes in my heart and head are healing, filling slowly with sensation. This compound was my home. These people, my family. I woke up this morning remembering my mother's favorite shade of lipstick, blood red. I remember watching her paint her lips some evenings. I remember the day I snuck into her room and stole the glossy metal tube. I remember when she found me, my hands and mouth smeared in red, my face a grotesque reimagining of herself. The more I remember my parents, the more I begin to finally make sense of myself. My many fears and insecurities, the myriad ways in which I've often felt lost, searching for something I could not name. It's devastating. And yet, in this new, turbulent reality, the one person I recognize anymore is him. My memories of him, memories of us, have done something to me. I've changed somewhere deep inside. I feel different, heavier, like my feet have been more firmly planted, liberated by certainty, free to grow roots here in my own self, free to trust unequivocally in the strength and steadiness of my own heart. It's an empowering discovery to find that I can trust myself, even when I'm not myself, to make the right choices. To know for certain now that there was at least one mistake I never made. Aaron Warner Anderson is the only emotional through line in my life that ever made sense. He's the only constant, the only steady, reliable heartbeat I've ever had. Aaron, 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 Aaron. I had no idea how much we'd lost, no idea how much of him I'd longed for. I had no idea how desperately we'd been fighting, how many years we'd fought for moments, minutes, to be together. It fills me with a painful kind of joy. But when I remember how I left things between us, I want to scream. I have no idea if I'll ever see him again. Still, I'm holding on to the hope that he's alive out there somewhere. Evie said she couldn't kill him. She said that she alone didn't have the authority to have him executed. And if Aaron is still alive, I will find a way to get to him. But I have to be careful. Breaking out of this new prison won't be easy. As it is, Evie almost never lets me out of my room. Worse, she sedates me during the day, allowing me only a couple of lucid hours. There's never enough time to think, much less to plan an escape to assess my surroundings, or to wander the halls outside my door. Only once did she let me go outside. Sort of. She let me onto a balcony overlooking the backyard. It wasn't much, but even that small step helped me understand a bit about where we were and what the layout of the building might look like. The assessment was chilling. We appeared to be in the center of a settlement, a small city, in the middle of nowhere. I leaned over the edge of the balcony, craning my neck to take in the breadth of it, but the view was so vast I couldn't see all the way around. 
From where I stood, I saw at least 20 different buildings, all connected by roads and navigated by people in miniature electric cars. There were loading and unloading docks, massive trucks filing in and out, and there was a landing strip in the distance, a row of jets parked neatly in a concrete lot. I understood then that I was living in the middle of a massive operation, something so much more terrifying than Sector 45. This is an international base. This has to be one of the capitals. Whatever this is, Whatever they do here, it makes Sector 45 look like a joke. Here, where the hills are somehow still green and beautiful, where the air is fresh and cool and everything seems alive. My accounting is probably off, but I think we're nearing the end of April, and the sights outside my window are unlike anything I've ever seen in Sector 45. Vast, snow-capped mountain ranges, Rolling hills thick with vegetation, trees heavy with bright, changing leaves, and a massive, glittering lake that looks close enough to run to. This land looks healthy, vibrant. I thought we'd lost a world like this a long time ago. Evie's begun to sedate me less these days, but some days my vision seems to fray at the edges, like a satellite image glitching, waiting for data to load. I wonder sometimes if she's poisoning me. I'm wondering this now, remembering the bowl of soup she sent to my room for breakfast. I can still feel the gluey residue as it coated my tongue, the roof of my mouth. Unease churns my stomach. I haul myself up off the bathroom floor, my limbs slow and heavy. It takes me a moment to stabilize. The effects of this experiment have left me hollow angry. As if out of nowhere, my mind conjures an image of Evie's face. I remember her eyes, deep, dark brown, bottomless, the same color as her hair. She has a short, sharp bob, a heavy curtain constantly whipping against her chin. She's a beautiful woman, more beautiful at 50 than she was at 20. Coming, the word occurs to me suddenly, and a bolt of panic shoots up my spine. Not a second later, there's a sharp knock at my bathroom door. Yes? Ella, you've been in the bathroom for almost half an hour, and you know how I feel about wasting time. Evie! I force myself to laugh. I'm almost done, I say. I'll be right out. A pause. The silence stretches the seconds into a lifetime. My heart jumps up into my throat, beats in my mouth. All right, she says slowly. Five more minutes. I close my eyes as I exhale, pressing the towel to the racing pulse at my neck. I dry off quickly before wringing the remaining water from my hair and slipping back into my robe. Finally, I open the bathroom door and welcome the cool morning temperature against my feverish skin but I hardly have a chance to take a breath before she's in my face again. Wear this, she says, forcing a dress into my arms. She's smiling, but it doesn't suit her. She looks deranged. You love wearing yellow. I blink as I take the dress from her, feeling a sudden disorienting wave of deja vu. Of course, I say. I love wearing yellow. Her smile grows thinner threatens to turn her face inside out. Could I just... I make an abstract gesture toward my body. Oh, she says, startled. Right. She shoots me another smile and says, I'll be outside. My own smile is brittle. She watches me. She always watches me, studies my reactions, the timing of my responses. She's scanning me constantly for information. She wants confirmation that I've been properly hollowed out, remade. I smile wider. Finally, she takes a step back. Good girl, she says softly. I stand in the middle of my room and watch her leave. The yellow dress is still pressed against my chest. There was another time when I'd felt trapped, just like this. 
I was held against my will and given beautiful clothes and three square meals and demanded to be something I wasn't, and I fought it. Fought it with everything I had. It didn't do me any good. I swore that if I could do it again, I'd do it differently. I said if I could do it over, I'd wear the clothes and eat the food and play along until I could figure out where I was and how to break free. So here's my chance. This time, I've decided to play along. Kenji. I wake up, bound and gagged a roaring sound in my ears. I blink to clear my vision. I'm bound so tightly I can't move, so it takes me a second to realize I can't see my legs. No legs, no arms either. The revelation that I'm invisible hits me with full horrifying force. I'm not doing this. I didn't bring myself here, bind and gag myself, and make myself invisible. There's only one other person who would. I look around, desperately, trying to gauge where I am and what my chances might be for escape, but when I finally manage to heave my body to one side, just long enough to crane my neck, I realize, with a terrifying jolt, that I'm on a plane. And then... Voices. It's Anderson and Nazira. I hear them discussing something about how we'll be landing soon, and then, minutes later... I feel it when we touch ground. The plane taxis for a while, and it seems to take forever before the engines finally turn off. I hear Anderson leave. Nazira hangs back, saying something about needing to clean up. She shuts down the plane and its cameras. Doesn't acknowledge me. Finally, I hear her footsteps getting closer to my head. She uses one foot to roll me onto my back, and then, just like that, my invisibility is gone. She stares at me for a little while longer. Says nothing. Finally, she smiles. Hi, she says, removing the gag from my mouth. How are you holding up? And I decide right then that I'm going to have to kill her. Okay, she says. I know you're probably upset. Upset? You think I'm upset? I jerk violently against the ties. Jesus Christ, woman, get me out of these goddamn restraints. I'll get you out of the restraints when you calm down. How can you expect me to be calm? I'm trying to save your life right now, so actually, I expect a lot of things from you. I'm breathing hard. Wait. What? She crosses her arms, stares down at me. I've been trying to explain to you that there was really no other way to do this. And don't worry, she says. Your friends are okay. We should be able to get them out of the asylum before any permanent damage is done. What? What do you mean, permanent damage? Nazira sighs. Anyway, this was the only way I could think of stealing a plane without attracting notice. I needed to track Anderson. So you knew he was alive that whole time, and you said nothing about it. She raises her eyebrows. Honestly, I thought you knew. How the hell was I supposed to know? I shout. How was I supposed to know anything? Stop shouting, she says. I went to all this trouble to save your life, but I swear to God I will kill you if you don't stop shouting right now. Where, I say, the hell, I say, are we? And instead of killing me, she laughs. Where do you think we are? She shakes her head. We're in Oceania. We're here to find Ella. Warner. We can live in the lake, she says simply. What? I almost laugh. What are you talking about? I'm serious, she says. I heard my mom talking about how to make it so people can live underwater and I'm going to ask her to tell me, and then we can live in the lake. I sigh. We can't live in the lake, Ella. Why not? She turns and looks at me, her eyes wide, startlingly bright. Blue-green. Like the globe, I think. 
like the whole world. Why can't we live in the lake? My mom says that, stop it, Ella, stop. I wake suddenly, jerking upward as my eyes fly open, my lungs desperate for air. I breathe in too fast and cough, choking on the overcorrection of oxygen. My body bows forward, chest heaving, my hands braced against the cold concrete floor. Ella. Ella. Pain spears me through the chest. I stopped eating the poisoned food two days ago, but the visions linger even when I'm lucid. There's something hyper real about this one in particular. The memory barreling into me over and over, shooting swift, sharp pains through my gut. It's breathtaking, this disorienting rush of emotion. For the first time, I'm beginning to believe. I thought nightmares, hallucinations even. But now I know. Now it seems impossible to deny. I heard my mom talking about how to make it so people can live underwater. I didn't understand right away why Max and Evie were keeping me captive here. But they must blame me for something. Maybe something my father is responsible for. Something I unknowingly took part in. Maybe something like torturing their daughter, Emmeline. When I was sent away for two years, I was never told where I was going. The details of my location were never disclosed. And during that time period, I lived in a veritable prison of my own, never allowed to step outside, never allowed to know more than was absolutely necessary about the task at hand. The breaks I was given were closely guarded, and I was required to wear a blindfold as I was ushered on and off the jet, which always made me think I must have been working somewhere easily identifiable. But those two years also comprised some of the darkest, saddest days of my life. All I knew was my desperate need for oblivion. I was so buried in self-loathing that it seemed only right to find solace in the arms of someone who meant nothing to me. I hated myself every day. Being with Lena was both relief and torture. Even so, I felt numb all the time. After two weeks here, I'm beginning to wonder if this prison isn't one I've known before. If this isn't the same place I spent those two horrible years of my life, it's hard to explain the intangible, irrational reasons why the view outside my window is beginning to feel familiar to me. But two years is a long time to grow familiar with the rhythms of a land, even one you don't understand. I wonder if Emmeline is here somewhere. It makes sense that she'd be here close to home, close to her parents, whose medical and scientific advances are the only reason she's even alive, or something close to alive anyway. It makes sense that they'd bring Juliet, Ella, I remind myself, back here to her home. The question is, why bring her here? What are they hoping to do with her? But then, if her mother is anything like my father, I think I can imagine what they might have in mind. I push myself off the floor and take a steadying breath. My body is running on mere adrenaline, so starved for sleep and sustenance that I have to... Pain. It's swift and sudden and I gasp even as I recognize the familiar sting. I have no idea how long it'll take for my ribs to fully heal. Until then, I clench my teeth as I stand, feeling blindly for purchase against the rough stone. My hands shake as I steady myself and I'm breathing too hard again, eyes darting around the familiar cell. I turn on the sink and splash ice cold water on my face. The effect is immediate, focusing, Carefully, I strip down to nothing. I soak my undershirt under the running water and use it to scrub my face, my neck, the rest of my body. I wash my hair, rinse my mouth, clean my teeth. And then I do what little I can for the rest of my clothes, washing them by hand and wringing them dry. I slip back into my underwear, even though the cotton is still slightly damp, and I fight back a shiver in the darkness. Hungry and cold is at least better than drugged and delirious. This is the end of my second week in confinement, and my third day this week without food. It feels good to have a clear head, even as my body slowly starves. I'd already been leaner than usual, but now the lines of my body feel unusually sharp, even to myself, 
all necessary softness gone from my limbs. It's only a matter of time before my muscles atrophy and I do irreparable damage to my organs. But right now, I have no choice. I need access to my mind. To think. And something about my sentencing feels off. The more I think about it, the less sense it makes that Max and Evie would want me to suffer for what I did to Emmeline. They were the ones who donated their daughters to the reestablishment in the first place. My work overseeing Emmeline was assigned to me. In fact, it was likely a job they'd approved. It would make more sense that I were here for treason. Max and Evie, like any other commanders, would want me to suffer for turning my back on the reestablishment. But even this theory feels wrong incongruous. The punishment for treason has always been public execution. Quick, efficient. I should be murdered with only a little fanfare in front of my own soldiers. But this, locking people up like this, slowly starving them while stripping them of their sanity and dignity, this is uncivilized. It's what the reestablishment does to others, not to its own. It's what they did to Ella. They tortured her ran tests on her. She wasn't locked up to inspire penitence. She was in isolation because she was part of an ongoing experiment. And I am in the unique position to know that such a prisoner requires constant maintenance. I figured I'd be kept here for a few days, maybe a week. But locking me up for what seems to be an indeterminate amount of time, this must be difficult for them. For two weeks, they've managed to remain just slightly ahead of me, a feat they accomplished by poisoning my food. In training, I'd never needed more than a week to break my way out of high-security prisons. and They must have known this. By forcing me to choose between sustenance and clarity every day, they've given themselves an advantage. Still, I'm unconcerned. The longer I'm here, the more leverage I gain. If they know what I'm capable of, they must also know that this is unsustainable. They can't use shock and poison to destabilize me indefinitely. I've now been here long enough to have taken stock of my surroundings, and I've been filing away information for nearly two weeks. The movements of the sun, the phases of the moon, the manufacturer of the locks, the sink, the unusual hinges on the door. I suspected, but now know for certain, that I'm in the southern hemisphere, not only because I know Max and Evie hail from Oceania, but because the northern constellations outside my window are upside down. I must be on their base. Logically, I know I must have been here a few times in my life, but the memories are dim. The night skies are clearer here than they were in Sector 45. The stars brighter. The lack of light pollution means we are far from civilization. The view out the window proves that we are surrounded on all sides by the wild landscape of this territory. There's a massive, glittering lake not far in the distance, which... Something jolts to life in my mind. The memory from earlier expanded. She shrugs and throws a rock in the lake. It lands with a dull splash. Well, we'll just run away, she says. We can't run away, I say. Stop saying that. We can too. There's nowhere to go. There are plenty of places to go. I shake my head. You know what I mean? They'd find us wherever we went. They watch us all the time. We can live in the lake, she says simply. What? I almost laugh. What are you talking about? I'm serious, she says. I heard my mom talking about how to make it so people can live underwater, and I'm going to ask her to tell me, and then we can live in the lake. I sigh. We can't live in the lake, Ella. Why not? She turns and looks at me, her eyes wide, startlingly bright. Blue-green. Like the globe, I think. Like the whole world. Why can't we live in the lake? My mom says that- Stop it, Ella. Stop. A cold sweat breaks out on my forehead. Goosebumps rise along my skin. Ella. Ella, Ella, Ella. Over and over again. Everything about the name is beginning to sound familiar. 
the movement of my tongue as I form the word, familiar. It's as if the memory is in my muscle, as if my mouth has made this shape a thousand times. I force myself to take a steadying breath. I need to find her. I have to find her. Here is what I know. It takes just under 30 seconds for the footsteps to disappear down the hall, and they're always the same. Same stride, same cadence, which means there's only one person attending to me. The paces are long and heavy, which means my attendant is tall, possibly male. Maybe Max himself, if they've deemed me a high-priority prisoner. Still, they've left me unshackled and unharmed. Why? And though I've been given neither bed nor blanket, I have access to water from the sink. There's no electricity in here, no outlets, no wires. But there must be cameras hidden somewhere, watching my every move. There are two drains, one in the sink and one underneath the toilet. There's one square foot of window, likely bulletproof glass, maybe eight to ten centimeters thick, and a single, small air vent in the floor. The vent has no visible screws, which means it must be bolted from inside, and the slats are too narrow for my fingers, the steel blades visibly welded in place. Still, it's only an average level of security for a prison vent. A little more time and clarity, and I'll find a way to remove the screen and repurpose the parts. Eventually, I'll find a way to dismantle everything in this room. I'll take apart the metal toilet, the flimsy metal sink. I'll make my own tools and weapons and find a way to slowly, carefully disassemble the locks and hinges. Or perhaps I'll damage the pipes and flood the room at its adjoining hallway, forcing someone to come to the door. The sooner they send someone to my room, the better. If they've left me alone in my cell this long, it's been for their own protection, not my suffering. I excel at hand-to-hand -hand combat. I know myself. I know my capacity to withstand complicated physical and mental torture. If I wanted to, I could give myself two, maybe three weeks to forgo the poisoned meals and survive on water alone before I lost my mind or mobility. I know how resourceful I can be given the opportunity, and this, this effort to contain me, must be exhausting. Great care went into selecting these sounds and meals and rituals, and even this vigilant lack of communication. It doesn't make sense that they'd go to all this trouble for treason. No. I must be in purgatory for something else. I rack my brain for a motive, but my memories are surprisingly thin when it comes to Max and Evie. Still forming. With some difficulty, I'm able to conjure up flickers of images. A brief handshake with my father. A burst of laughter, a cheerful swell of holiday music, a laboratory and my mother. I stiffen. A laboratory and my mother. I focus my thoughts, honing in on the memory. Bright lights, muffled footsteps, the sound of my own voice asking my father a question. And then, painfully, my mind goes blank. I frown, stare into my hands. Nothing. I know a great deal about the other commanders and their families. It's been my business to know. But there's an unusual dearth of information where Oceania is concerned. And for the first time, it sends a shock of fear through me. There are two timelines merging in my mind. A life with Ella and a life without her and I'm still learning to sift through the information for something real. Still, thinking about Max and Evie now seems to strain something in my brain. It's as if there's something there, something just out of reach, and the more I force my mind to recall them, their faces, their voices, the more it hurts. Why all this trouble to imprison me? Why not simply have me killed? I have so many questions, it's making my head spin. Just then, the door rattles. The sound of metal on metal is sharp and abrasive. The sounds like sandpaper against my nerves. I hear the bolt unlock and feel unusually calm. I was built to handle this life. Its blows, its sick sadistic ways. Death has never scared me. But when the door swings open, I realize my mistake. 
I imagined a thousand different scenarios. I prepared for a myriad of opponents. But I had not prepared for this. Hi, birthday boy, he says, laughing as he steps into the light. Did you miss me? And I'm suddenly unable to move. Ella. Stop, stop it. Oh my God, that's disgusting. Emmeline cries. Stop it. Stop touching each other. You guys are so gross. Dad pinches mom's butt right in front of us. Emmeline screams, oh my God, I said stop. It's Saturday morning and Saturday morning is when we make pancakes. But mom and dad don't really get around to cooking anything because they won't stop kissing each other. Emmeline hates it. I think it's nice. I sit at the counter and prop my face in my hands watching. I prefer watching. Emmeline keeps trying to make me work, but I don't want to. I like sitting better than working. No one is making pancakes, Emmeline cries, and she spins around so angrily she knocks a bowl of batter to the ground. Why am I doing all the work? Dad laughs. Sweetheart, we're all together, he says, scooping up the fallen bowl. He grabs a bunch of paper towels and says, Isn't that more important than pancakes? No, Emmeline says angrily. We're supposed to make pancakes. It's Saturday, which means we're supposed to make pancakes, and you and Mom are just kissing, and Ella is being lazy. Hey, I say, and stand up. And no one is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and instead, I'm doing it all by myself. Mom and Dad are both laughing now. It's not funny! Emmeline cries, and now she's shouting, tears streaking down her face. It's not funny, and I don't like it when no one listens to me, and I don't. Two weeks ago, I was lying on an operating table, limp, naked, and leaking blood through an aperture in my temple the size of a gunshot wound. My vision was blurred. I couldn't hear much more than the sound of my own breathing, hot and heavy and everywhere, building in and around me. Suddenly, Evie came into view. She was staring at me. She seemed frustrated. She'd been trying to complete the process of physical recalibration, as she called it. For some reason, she couldn't finish the job. She'd already emptied the contents of 16 syringes into my brain, and she'd made several small incisions in my abdomen, my arms, and my thighs. I couldn't see exactly what she did next, but she spoke occasionally, as she worked. And she claimed that the simple surgical procedures she was performing would strengthen my joints and reinforce my muscles. She wanted me to be stronger, to be more resilient on a cellular level. It was a preventative measure, she said. She was worried my build was too slight, that my muscles might degenerate prematurely in the face of intense physical challenges. She didn't say it, but I felt it. She wanted me to be stronger than my sister. Emmeline, I whispered. It was lucky that I was too exhausted, too broken, too sedated to speak clearly. It was lucky that I only lay there, eyes fluttering open and closed, my chapped lips making it impossible to do more than mutter the name. It was lucky that I couldn't understand right away, that I was still me that I still remembered everything, despite Evie's promises to dissolve what was left of my mind. Still, I'd said the wrong thing. Evie stopped what she was doing. She leaned over my face and studied me, nose to nose. I blinked. Don't. The words appeared in my head as if they'd been planted there long ago, like I was remembering, remembering. Evie jerked backward and immediately started speaking into a device clenched in her fist. Her voice was low and rough, and I couldn't make out what she was saying. I blinked again, confused. I parted my lips to say something when, don't. The thought came through more sharply this time. A moment later, Evie was in my face again, this time drilling me with questions. Who are you? Where are you? 
What is your name? Where were you born? How old are you? Who are your parents? Where do you live? I was suddenly aware enough to understand that Evie was checking her work. She wanted to make sure my brain had been wiped clean. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to say or do, so I said nothing. Instead, I blinked. Blinked a lot. Evie finally, reluctantly, stepped away, but she didn't seem entirely convinced of my stupidity. And then, when I thought she might murder me just to be safe, she stopped, stared at the wall. And then she left. I was trembling on the operating table for 20 minutes before the room was swarmed by a team of people. They unstrapped my body, washed and wrapped my open wounds. I think I was screaming. Eventually, the combination of pain, exhaustion, and the slow drip of opiates caught up with me, and I passed out. I never understood what happened that day. I couldn't ask. Evie never explained, and the strange, sharp voice in my head never returned. But then, Evie sedated me so much in my first weeks on this compound that it's possible there was never even a chance. Today, for the first time since that day, I hear it again. I'm standing in the middle of my room, this gauzy yellow dress still bunched in my arms when the voice assaults me. It knocks the wind out of me. Ella! I spin around, my breasts coming in fast. The voice is louder than it's ever been, frightening in its intensity. Maybe I was wrong about Evie's experiment. Maybe this is part of it. Maybe hallucinating and hearing voices is a precursor to oblivion. No. Who are you, I say, the dress dropping to the floor. It occurs to me, as if from a distance, that I'm standing in my underwear, screaming at an empty room, and a violent shudder goes through my body. Roughly, I yank the yellow dress over my head, its light, breezy layers like silk against my skin. In a different lifetime, I would have loved this dress. It's both beautiful and comfortable, the perfect sartorial combination, but there's no time for that kind of frivolity anymore. Today, this dress is just a part of the role I must play. The voice in my head has gone quiet, but my heart is still racing. I feel propelled into motion by instinct alone, and quickly, I slip into a pair of simple white tennis shoes, tying the laces tightly. I don't know why, but today, right now, for some reason, I feel like I might need to run. Yes! My spine straightens. Adrenaline courses through my veins, and my muscles feel tight burning with an intensity that feels brand new to me. It's the first time I've felt any positive effects of Evie's procedures. This strength feels like it's been grafted to my bones, like I could launch myself into the air, like I could scale a wall with one hand. I've known super strength before, but that strength always felt like it was coming from elsewhere, like it was something I had to harness and release. Without my supernatural abilities, when I turned off my powers, I was left with an unimpressive, flimsy body. I'd been undernourished for years, forced to endure extreme physical and mental conditions, and my body suffered for it. I'd only begun to learn proper forms of exercise and conditioning in the last couple of months, and while the progress I made was helpful, it was only the first step in the right direction. But this, whatever Evie did to me, this is different. Two weeks ago, I was in so much pain I could hardly move. The next morning, when I could finally stand on my own, I saw no discernible difference in my body except that I was seven shades of purple from top to bottom. Everything was bruised. I was walking agony. Evie told me, as my doctor, that she kept me sedated so that I'd be forced to remain still in order to heal more quickly. But I had no reason to believe her. I still don't. But this is the first time in two weeks that I feel almost normal. The bruises have nearly faded. Only the incision sites, the most painful entry points, still look a little yellow. Not bad. I flex my fists and feel powerful, truly powerful, even with the glowing manacles clamped around my wrists and ankles. I've desperately missed my powers, 
missed them more than I ever thought I could miss something I'd spent so many years hating about myself. But for the first time in weeks, I feel strong. I know Evie did this to me, did this to my muscles, and I know I should distrust it, but it feels so good to feel good that I almost can't help but revel in it. And right now, I feel like I could run. I go still. Run. What? I whisper, turning to scan the walls, the ceiling. Run where? Out. The word thunders through me, reverberates along my rib cage. Out. As if it were that simple. As if I could turn the doorknob and be rid of this nightmare. If it were that easy to leave this room, I would have done it already. But Evie reinforces the locks on my door with multiple layers of security. I only saw the mechanics of it once when she returned me to my room after allowing me to look outside for a few minutes. In addition to the discreet cameras and retina displays, there's a biometric scanner that reads Evie's fingerprints to allow her access to the room. I've spent hours trying to get my bedroom door open to no avail. Out. Again, that word, loud and harsh inside my head. There's something terrifying about the hope that snakes through me at the thought of escape. It clings and tugs and tempts me to be crazy enough to listen to the absurd hallucinations attacking my mind. This could be a trap, I think. This could all be Evie's doing. I could be playing directly into her hand. Still, I can't help myself. I cross the room in a few quick strides. I hesitate, my hand hovering over the handle, and with a final exhalation, I give in. The door swings open easily. I stand in the open doorway, my heart racing harder. A heady rush of feeling surges through me, and I look around desperately, studying the many hallways stretching out before me. This seems impossible. I have no idea where to go, no idea if I'm crazy for listening to a manipulative voice in my head after my psychotic mother spent hours injecting things into my mind. It's only when I remember that I first heard this voice the night I arrived, just moments before Evie began torturing me, that I begin to doubt my doubt. Dying. That was what the voice said to me that first night. Dying. I was lying on an operating table, unable to move or speak. I could only shout inside my head, and I wanted to know where Emmeline was. I tried to scream it. Dying, the voice had said. A cold, paralyzing fear fills my blood. Emmeline? I whisper. Is that you? Help. I take a certain step forward, 